we must understand the heart of God toward the very poor sinner who couldn't even afford a couple of cheap birds. And for that, we must study the context of the verse. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss and right now we're in episode five of our series based on a book, God, Forgive Me, by my father, Dr. Randy Weiss. Just a side note, if you wanna get a free digital copy of this book, you can do that at our website, crosstalk.org. You can also order a hard copy from the same website if you prefer. This book discusses the sacrifice that's required by God to atone for sin. Don't worry, we aren't going to tell you that you need to go out and sacrifice any animals. When you accept Jesus as your savior, the sacrifice he gave on the cross, it covers you. But it's still important that we understand why his sacrifice paid for your sins. That's what this book and this series aims to teach. So let's jump right in. So I'm here to talk about sin and sacrifice. Long before Moses codified the atonement obligations, Noah was given his orders. He lived his life in a manner that pleased God and he had a plan. Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Most folks envisioned the animals parading two by two in mated pairs onto the vessel captained by Noah. That Sunday school portrayal ignores the need for sacrifices. If Noah had only brought two cows and one was sacrificed, McDonald's could never have created a sustainable Big Mac. I'm not a biologist or a math major, but if only one cow remained after the world's first altar call, we'd all be asking, where's the beef? The Genesis account makes clear that only the biblically unclean animals were gathered in single pairs. Presumably that protected the species supernaturally created by God for the purpose of naturally procreating. We should be cognizant that God ordered Noah to have the clean animals board the ark in significantly larger numbers. Seven by seven of every clean beast thou shalt take to the seven and seven each with his mate. The distinction between the census of clean and unclean animals is significant. Among the clean animals, only two were needed to procreate and only one was required to be offered on the altar by Noah. Having seven males and seven females of each of the species of clean animals left plenty of cushion for safely transporting enough clean animals to get the job done. Yet one may ask, what was the job? In my opinion, the task was to protect a sufficient number of clean animals to procreate so as to maintain the species and to allow Noah to find a healthy, unblemished victim from every clean species for the sacrificial altar. God's well-planned cushion offset much of the risk, ensuring that at least one unblemished example from every species arrives safely without being broken, bruised, or made ceremonially impure during the rough ride in steerage for those animals that survived the flood. A worldwide flood undoubtedly made waves, big waves. Riding those waves would have set the ark on a, a bumpy, wild ride for Noah and his assembly of animal passengers. It also created an environment for the clean animals to multiply faster than the unclean. After Noah and the ark landed, he immediately built his altar and began the task of making animal sacrifices. The act of worship and sacrifice was very pleasing to God. He called Noah's burnt offerings a sweet savor. The result of Noah's newly instituted practice of clean, acceptable animal sacrifice touched the heart of God as a direct result of Noah's pleasing sacrifice. The Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, 
summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Everyone on earth had been tainted by sin. As a result, God reigned death across the entire antediluvian world. God wiped out every single human being on the planet except Noah and his family. That was one way to remove sin from the earth. Let's thank God that it won't happen like that again. God's promise to Noah assures us of that fact, and it's profoundly revealing that the famous covenant with Noah was birthed in sacrifice. Sin brought death. Sacrifice brought God's promise. The flood was won and done, but sin endured. Sadly, sin did not end with the flood. Therefore, the need for a sacrifice did not end with Noah. As we all know, Moses refined the sacrificial system under God's direction. Different sins called for different types of sacrifices, and different types of sacrificial offerings were handled by the priests in different ways. Moses called for specific burnt offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings, and several forms of peace offerings, and others as described within the first six chapters of the book of Leviticus and elsewhere. The system of sacrifices ordered by God through Moses required living animals to be ritually killed by trained priests and Levites. The bodies and blood of the sacrificial victims were used in very distinctive but very different ways. In some cases, the, the blood was sprinkled on the altar. In other cases, the blood was actually applied to a person's earlobe and thumb and big toe. If a reporter had been present, the headline would have aptly described a bloody mess. Different types of animals were required by Moses. Sometimes a female of the species was demanded. At other times, a male version was preferred. Periodically, it was a very young animal, like a lamb, as opposed to a mature animal. Some of the animals walked on all fours. At other times, the animals were required to have wings and feathers. Intellectual integrity demands it be acknowledged that in a few instances, a grain offering was accepted. However, such exceptions were often supplemented with a burnt offering or peace offering, which did require the death of an unblemished victim. In almost all cases, the sacrificial system ordered by God and inscripturated by Moses demanded the sacrificial slaughter of an unblemished lamb, ox, sheep, goat, dove, or a pigeon. But there was one fascinating circumstance that appears to suggest otherwise. We must not ignore the exception to the rule. Full transparency requires me to mention that I glossed over the grain offering exception a little too quickly. In fact, uh, at a point when I thought that this book, this, the preparation for this conversation, when I thought it was finished and I was ready to go to press, I had what some might call a revelation. Others would call it an, oh no, moment, or perhaps something even more colorful. <laughs> I suddenly realized my book had a big problem. My research revealed an apparent contradiction to aspects of God's words found in the fifth chapter of Leviticus. I assumed that many of my readers would have let me slide or not even noticed the fly in the ointment. God, however, is a much tougher literary critic when authors are using his material. My moment came during a recent casual rereading of the Bible from a modern paraphrase. I was enjoying the read when the words forced me to reevaluate this section of my research and my preparation my own work, um, I decided I could not move forward without asking and answering a few questions in light of the language used about a grain offering in this fascinating modern paraphrase that I was reading. The text simply stated, if you cannot afford the two doves or pigeons, bring two quarts of fine flour for your absolution 
offering. Stop the presses. So that raised the question, does God allow special dispensation to a very poor sinner in need of a specific sacrifice to secure atonement? Well, the answer is apparently in special cases he does. And that, of course, raises another question. Does the substance of that unique text discredit the premise of my book and my research in this discussion? Obviously, the focal point of what I am trying to present suggests that a sacrifice is required to atone for sins. So, the answer to that difficult question is no. Atonement was always achieved through a biblically prescribed sacrifice. But once again, <laughs> there's another question. The title of this book asks the question, Will God Forgive Me? And the rather catchy subtitle, if I may say so myself, presumes to answer that question with, Sure, but something or someone must die. After reading the paraphrase, it seems like I made an oops, given what Moses had mentioned in Leviticus chapter 5, verse 11. But did I make an oops? The answer is, perhaps an asterisk should maybe be in order. <laughs> and this brings me to a quasi mea culpa. I wasn't exactly wrong, but I certainly could have been more right. As I'd said above, intellectual integrity absolutely demands it be acknowledged that in a few instances, a grain offering was accepted. And it is also true that with some such exceptions, the sacrifices were supplemented with a burnt offering or a peace offering. And these examples did require the death of an unblemished victim. But we must understand the heart of God toward the very poor sinner who couldn't even afford a couple of cheap birds. And for that, we must study the context of the verse that I had mentioned. What God actually wanted brought as a sacrifice is described as follows. Bring as your penalty to God for the sin you have committed, a female lamb or goat from the flock for an absolution offering. In this way, the priests will make atonement for your sin. If you can't afford a lamb, bring as your penalty to God for the sin you have committed, two doves or two pigeons, one for the absolution offering and the other for the whole burnt offering. Bring them to the priest who will first offer the one for the absolution offering. He'll wring its neck, but not sever it. Splash some of the blood of the absolution offering against the altar and squeeze the rest of it out at the base. It's an absolution offering. He'll then take the second bird and offer it as a whole burnt offering. Following the procedures step by step in this way, the priest will make atonement for your sin and you're forgiven. If you cannot afford the two doves or pigeons, bring two quarts of fine flour to your absolution offering. It's from Leviticus chapter 5, verses 6 to 11 from the message. When, when I read that last sentence of the section in this paraphrase, my initial inclination was to let sleeping dogs lie. However, my listeners, my viewers, the people who read my book would not have been able to trust me had I caved into that inclination. And I want my audience to consider my conclusions in the bright light of truth, magnified by the disinfecting rays of the sun. I know that Leviticus is not the most beloved book in the canon of Scripture. Some find it excruciatingly boring and tend to skip it. And that's all the more reason why I likely could have skated by ignoring this exception to the rule or leaving it with the previously written words that in almost all cases, the sacrificial system ordered by God and inscripturated by Moses demanded the sacrificial slaughter of an unblemished lamb, ox, sheep, goat, or a pigeon. These words are correct and may have been sufficient for me to sleep at night or to respond to critics if that were necessary, but should that exception should that odd case be ignored 
And the answer is no. So I chose to use this problem as a teachable moment. I needed to be taught. I had questions and now I've reached some relevant conclusions to share in review of this interesting exception. It's healthy to remember that God is merciful to the poor. In the case of the sins described in the fifth chapter of Leviticus, God did not exclude the poor from securing the atonement they needed due to their financial status. It's wise to remember that the priests received their daily bread from the portions of the sacrifices that God intended for their provision. In other words, their protein came from specifically instructed portions of the animals that were sacrificed. Some of their carbs came from portions of the grain offerings brought to them as sacrifices to God, and folks do need to eat. The priesthood was a pretty good gig that included food as an important fringe benefit. It is instructive to remember that although God expected a lamb or goat to be sacrificed, he was willing to settle for two doves or two pigeons. And if even the birds were unaffordable to some, an offering of grain was acceptable. Nevertheless, keep in mind for nomads wandering in the desert, grain was a pretty valuable commodity. So even though it wasn't livestock, the sacrifice was still something dear to the sinner securing an atonement from the priest. To address the exception, the sins described at the beginning of the fifth chapter of Leviticus must be explored. After all, this is about the sin which brings judgment to a sinner. So what were the sins that were being atoned for by this specific offering? Was it murder? Was it adultery? Was it cheating at cards? I found the sin list to be personally troublesome. You see, the first verse begins with, if you sin by not stepping up and offering yourself as a witness to something you've heard or seen in cases of wrongdoing, you'll be held responsible. And that sort of speaks to my current dilemma. I was on the verge of not stepping up as a witness to my own error by leaving evidence out of this presentation that seemed to contradict my core premise. It would have been unintentional because until I'd read the paraphrase described, I hadn't noticed the problem. In a way, the text in Leviticus is closely akin to a parallel verse in the New Testament, which is quite convicting. It says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Of course, the text of Leviticus more closely implies a legal setting where someone was a first-hand witness to a situation where holding back a truth would lead to a miscarriage of justice. For example, the unwillingness of a witness to step up at a trial could lead to the imprisonment of an innocent victim who was wrongly accused. Or it could lead to other innocent victims being harmed by a guilty offender set free because nobody was bold enough to come forward with the truth about the criminal's wrongdoing. Shirking one's responsibility to step up is a sin. The second and third verses of that text address ritual impurities of which a person suddenly becomes aware. And it says, or if you touch anything ritually unclean, like the carcass of an unclean animal, wild or domestic, or a dead reptile, and you weren't aware of it at the time, but you're contaminated and you're guilty, or if you touch human uncleanness, any sort of ritually contaminating uncleanness, and you're not aware of it at the time, but later you realize it and you're guilty. <laughs> Contrary to what some assume, nowhere does the Bible say cleanliness is next to godliness. Your mother may have said that, but God did not. He used different words. But I believe he communicated that uncleanness shuts the front door to ritual purity and there is no back door. If a person touches something unclean, it makes them unclean. And if a person has accidentally touched something unclean and they don't even realize it when they figure it out, they are then guilty. So there's a sense in which if you have no sense of smell, but you have stepped in a pile of stink, 
until someone with clear nostrils calls it what it is, it's as if it never happened. And this causes me to digress for two brief stories. Number one, I had a close friend in West Virginia who had come to Israel on a tour that my wife and I had hosted. While there, he told me about his childhood. He grew up barefoot and happy in very rural surroundings. On cold mornings, he particularly enjoyed walking through the family's cow pasture, looking for the spots with steam rising from the patties. <laughs> he said it felt nice and warm, squishing up between his toes. We laughed about that for many years until he went to be with the Lord. Don't judge him. He became a respected physician and a Christian role model. And number two, my father of blessed memory was one of 10 Orthodox Jewish children in his family from rural Hungary. When still quite young, he was running in their little field and fell through the rotten boards that had covered the hole of an abandoned outhouse. He almost drowned in the mire. One of his older sisters spared his life by pulling him out before it was too late. After emigrating to America between the pogroms and the Nazis, my father became a highly respected local businessman. He defied the odds against his success, overcoming the limitations of being a Jewish immigrant with a fourth grade education. By the way, he never finished the fifth grade because he had to get a job to help his family survive after the depression in America. Don't judge him. The running joke in the Weiss family was that my dad had fallen into a pile of <clears throat> and came out smelling like a rose. In his case, the family cleaned him up as good as new. The things he learned and accomplished enabled him to lead a very full and productive life. In both stories, they knew what they'd stepped in, one by choice and the other a near tragic accident. Both gents eventually required cleaning because their uncleanness was too obvious to overlook. Yet some forms of uncleanness are not so easily detectable. It, it happens that someone might accidentally brush up against an unclean thing or step on something unseen but unclean. It may seem near meaningless, yet it rendered the person ritually impure. This rather obscure section of Scripture adds light to this concept. In some cases, such as those quoted in Leviticus, it is the knowledge of our sin that makes us guilty. It is when we realize what we have done that we become responsible for the guilt associated with the sin. Another translation states it with unmistakable clarity. It says, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty. Essentially, it implies guilt over these specific sins is a matter of conscience. If one is unaware, innocence is apparently retained. As soon as one gains the knowledge of their ritual uncleanness, they are then ritually unclean. Perhaps it is like babies and infants who don't know the difference between right and wrong. There may be some mystical age of accountability that creates the distinction. Leviticus does seem to propose a case for an active conscience and the knowledge of ritual impurity to be held as ritually impure. But we can be sure that sin can go beyond ritual purity because life is about more than rituals. The final form of sin covered by this brief section of Leviticus is perhaps the most relevant to modern folk. It says, if you impulsively swear to do something, whether good or bad, some rash oath that just pops out and you aren't aware of what you've done at the time, but later you come to realize it and you're guilty in any of these cases, when you are guilty, immediately confess the sin that you've committed. My guess is that most of us have spoken impulsively or uttered rash statements in the heat of the moment or while engaged in a social media diatribe. If we have spoken thoughtlessly and our words have damaged others, 
When we realize the harm caused by our words, we are guilty, and one's guilt is known. Only a sacrifice can clear our guilt. This knowledge also adds another layer of responsibility. It becomes very harsh to cruelly announce a person's guilt to them. It may be more kind to allow God to convict them of their sin in His own time instead of rubbing their nose in it before they are prepared by God to address their infraction. Guilt brings judgment. It takes little faith and less obedience to splatter someone's guilt all over their face or Facebook. True faith and spiritual maturity may best be shown by always pointing the guilty back to a state of innocence. One can't unknow guilt. It is carried until it consumes the guilty or is atoned for through the innocent. But forgiveness is available. Moses explained that God wants us to confess our sins immediately and then he demanded we follow through with the sacrifice he prescribed. In almost every case, it was a blood sacrifice of a living, unblemished, perfect sacrificial victim. In the rare occurrence of the above described sins, if a person was really poor, a grain offering was substituted. If your sins are limited to the short list I mentioned, I have great news for you if you want to avoid a bloody mess. That is, if you are really, really poor. I think you can find atonement by immediately bringing a grain offering to God if you can find a priest to perform the sacrifice at the tabernacle or in the temple. A sacrifice is definitely required for atonement. For all the other sins on our record, grain won't pay the freight, whether you're rich or poor. And you ain't gonna find no priest or no altar in a temple, because it ain't there. So as we merrily walk our journey of life, perhaps we should scan the path ahead to miss the piles and literal pitfalls we should avoid. And if we encounter some poor soul who became distracted and stepped in it, don't label them as stinky. Rather, humbly hand them some paper towels and point them to the priest who has the cure for every unfortunate, unclean encounter. We can all be made clean, but not until we know about the dirt we might be carrying. But beware, merely announcing one's deficiency creates guilt unless we can lead someone to the sanitizer of our soul. All we do is create embarrassment, confusion, and guilt. Well, we need to pause the teaching right there for now, but don't worry, we'll pick up right where we left off in the next episode. I encourage you to follow us on social media with the handle at Crosstalk TV. Also, if you'd like to get a copy of the book that this series is based on, well, head over to the crosstalk.org website to order your copy there. Until next time, shalom and God bless.